morning. Usually I have somebody introducing why we're here, what we're doing. I, I don't have the luxury today. Maybe you can tell me what we're doing here and I can make sure I can hopefully my presentation meets uh, those needs. Um, so are all of you first, second, third year residents? No. No. Okay. Medical students, uh, residents, combination of all the above, great. So one reason why, first of all, I'm Luca. Um, I've, I've been working at the University of Utah for about three years now. Uh, prior to that, I worked in intermountain healthcare for another five years, uh, mainly doing this similar things, uh, helping with uh, our cultural transformation into uh, focus on value, implementing efficiency principles to help us really drive uh, uh, better processes for the stakeholders, all of stakeholders, the providers, the nurses, the MAs, all those individuals that are providing care for the patients. But I need to say that, but at the same time, we're trying to create better processes for our patients so we can ultimately provide better care with a buzzword, uh, higher quality, lower cost, blah, 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 yes, we get it. But hopefully, by the end of the day, you'll have a better, by the end of one hour, you'll have a better understanding of what I'm trying to say with that and how we're going to do that. So one of the things that uh, uh, it, has become, it has become obvious as I uh, participate in many of these discussions, uh, I focus mostly on the education piece, education and research. That's, that's the... Uh, stakeholders that I that I work with, my counterparts are helping, in, are facilitating discussions and improving uh, hospital and clinics processes. I am working towards the, I'm working to improve the education research processes, and I get I have the opportunity to work with a, with a graduate education as well as undergraduate education. I work with various colleges, nursing, dentistry, and so on, and. Uh, uh, and so one of the things I'm asked occasionally is to participate in the residency QI programs. Uh, again, another buzzword, but it really implies that this, there is an interest as well as a mandate. I'm going to focus on the interest because it's important uh, for the various pr residency programs to engage and tap into this workforce, these resources that it's you. Uh, because you see the processes, you see what goes on in, in, in caring for the patients, so we can leverage your knowledge and expertise and your time, hopefully without asking too much more of that, uh, in helping improve uh, the way we're caring for the patients as well as the way that I would say we're educating you to become uh, ex experts in helping others uh, in, in changing processes. So I call my presentation Introduction to Value Engagement because by the time I'm done with this, yes. we'll, we'll talk more. Uh, Laura and Hanson will be reaching out to you as far as next steps. So is uh, Jeff Pitty, Diane Warner, Barbara Wurosko, and so on. I've all been working with them. This presentation is part of my discussions with them. Uh, but for now, my goal is to touch on some principles. Hopefully have a conversation. I know it's early in the morning, but feel free to interrupt me anytime and ask if you have any questions, and I may pause as well. Uh, but uh, let me get started. So the main thing that I'm here to talk about is basically that is this principle of value uh, that you're going to hear at nausea within the university, uh, value this, value that. And uh, it's really, we have, it's kind of like our branded concept for process improvement. Uh, I'm going to use various words that are interchangeably, but for now let's use the word value. And so focusing on value allows us to ask if our activities are moving us forward in delivering what our customers expect of us. Um, this is a we want to pay attention to our, what our customers expect from us. Um, why? Why do you think it's important? Customers meaning patients, but I would also add customers meaning any person behind after your processes, after what you do. 
So they can be the next doctor in line, can be a next nurse in line, waiting for you to complete an order or see the patients or exit the room and so on. But most importantly, the patient, that they're waiting for you to do something for them. Why it's important that you pay attention to what their, what their needs are. Okay, while you think about your answer, this is a video that Toyota, which is kind of one of the main thinkers of where we have copied a lot of their principles from back in the 80s, they started to consult with, uh, for non-profit, for other organizations. One of these organizations is uh, Eye Clinic, and hopefully this will get in the right, set the mood for the conversation. Wait. Thank you. My name is Lisette Urias, and I've been a diabetic for 15 years, from the age of about 17. I was in need of board medication, so I stopped using it uh, for about five years. My eyesight goes blurry and I see flashing lights throughout the edges. I did not know that diabetes would cause this type of damage to my eye. It would be nice to be able to see my family, my surroundings, especially my nieces and nephews. I'm sorry. Um, I lose my energy a lot, focusing through one eye, it drains me, so I feel like I'm not there for them as much, it, it's hard on me, I try to be the stronger one. Lizette is a great example of our patient population. She's young and she didn't have access to care. We are a county-owned facility, and our mission is to serve the underserved. She came in with diabetes that was out of control, high blood pressure. In addition, she was bleeding into her eye. We had a surgical wait list that was hundreds of patients long, and to not be able to intervene in a timely fashion was, was really, really difficult to deal with. Lizette and patients like Lizette would have to wait for months for surgery and in the process were going blind. Toyota was contacted by the Harvard UCLA Medical Center and when I heard that many patients were going blind waiting to get service, I actually couldn't believe it. How can that happen in the United States? People ask all the time, what on earth do making cars have to do with hospitals and healthcare? Hospitals and health systems are looking to the Toyota production system to improve, and we reached out to them. We really didn't know what was wrong. Sometimes when you work in chaos, you don't know how to get out of it. So what Toyota did for us is they helped us learn to see our own environment. And so we did observations. We stood in the clinic and watched the process flow. We just had a table with all the charts lined up, one big mountain full of papers. Doctors were frustrated, nurses were frustrated. So with the color-coded system, now we know red is the latest. Bam, here's your patient. It's so much easier for everyone. Physicians were spending more time in the hallway than they were in the clinic. And the reason why is that they didn't have the supplies they needed close by. Now that sounds like a very simple solution, and it turned out to be. We asked them, what do you need at the clinic side? Part of Toyota's message is that this is our hospital. They're not going to be here to tell us how to do things. They're going to come here and teach us how we can identify ways to make ourselves better. It's changing our culture. It's transforming us as an organization. We're not the same organization we were a year ago. We're taking some of the lessons that we learned from the eye clinic and are spreading the change throughout the hospital. An open photo classroom, you said? Great. You did really, really well. Over the past two years, we've taken a surgical backlog that was hundreds of patients long, and we've eliminated it. It's five o'clock, and all the patients have been seen. This is the best project I have ever had. I've 
work when we do work. Here, we actually help people. <laughs> I never would have thought that implementing the Toyota production system would help save lives or keep people from going blind, but it has. Can you make it how many fingers I'm holding? Focus on patient. And the reason, the reason why I started it ahead, and that's the reason why I showed this video, is because by the time I'm done showing you a few more slides and I talk about value, and if you can substitute the concept of, of uh, value improvement work or value methodology to the Toyota production system, what we're trying to do is the same, we just rebranded it, uh, is that what we're doing is for the patient. So instead of having a backlog, of 100 or 10 patients a day, you don't have one. That you can always find what you need at the bedside, or that uh, everything works clockwork in a way that makes sense so you can take care of the patients. And so when we talk about the concept of value added, so, okay, backtrack for a moment. What's value in your mind? What are some of your thoughts? When I say the word value or value to the patient, what comes to mind? Time, health. Time, health, okay. Anything else? Patient comes to us for two reasons, information about their health and care provision. Anything besides that is non-value added. I didn't make the rule, but I just the way it is. And so an activity is value added when it builds on patient's information or is directly involved in patient's care. Therefore, if what we're doing doesn't move us closer to delivering what customers are expecting from us, that step in the process should be eliminated. Now, so there are three things you gotta remember. Value added activity, seeing the patient, talking with them, yes, value added. Um, writing in order, probably value added. Charting is, Getting there, but it is added. If it's added to the knowledge, sure, it's value added. Uh, physician having to walk away from the OR because I'm looking for some supplies. What is that? Non value added. Uh, having to chart for government purposes. What is that? It's non value added, but necessary. And unfortunately, this box here will always stay there, but our goal is to minimize the impact to the system so that we can focus on these steps while we're reducing those two steps there. Um, so if we can, we want to eliminate steps. If we can't, we, can, we gotta live with them, but at the same time help us keep, move, keep the process moving forward. Uh, any thoughts, questions? That's a big slide. Um, in the concept of, wow, that's kind of cool. How did I do that? I should, what's supposed to happen? Uh, in the concept of non-value added activities, there is the, uh, we categorize, if you want, this is just a list. It does, of, there are these activities, these steps, these things that take place within our work environment that we consider wastes. Um, it is nothing personal. Our work is not wasteful, although we may feel like it sometimes. Don't, I'm not picking on anybody. Uh, maybe I'm picking on myself, perhaps. Most of what I do is maybe considered non-value added to the patient, in reality, and yet they're paying for me. But I'm non-value added. But the most, but in my little part, if I can help people be more effective and efficient in what they're doing, then I'm in, impacting a tiny bit of uh, the healthcare provision as well. So, seven ways. When you're going out and taking care of the patient, try to think about these. When you notice them, you know that you have spotted a non-value added activity. 
and your light bulb should go up, and she'll say, ah, I found one. And then there are steps to remove them or address them another time. But that's what I'm hoping, that as you go out there, you start thinking, oh, these two meds look the same. They shouldn't be looking the same. I have no idea what they are. Why are they looking the same? I'm gonna, be co I'm gonna confuse myself or others. Or, oh, I operated on a patient with the wrong eye. That used to happen a lot more. Now it doesn't because we learn. We learn that errors or defects shouldn't be happening. Inventory. Uh, we surely love that one here in hospitals because we never find blank. 10 years ago, we couldn't find blankets. So we're gonna hoard all of them. Or we're gonna stock all these supplies because we get a discount by our vendors, so we're gonna buy 200 more than we ever need. But you know, we got space in the hospital, so no big deal. So inventory takes space, costs money, and we, don't, we want to eliminate it. Uh, Overprocessing. <laughs> I was trying to think, how do you put that one? And then I realized, this is an academic medical center. There are, within a scenario, you got students, all kind of students, nurses, MA, nurses, doctors, all in the room, all, doing, all working on one poor patient when in there. So I just imagine a room full of people doing lots of work. Overprocessing is not just that, though. Overprocessing is doing something it's doing more than you need to. Again, we're trying to provide information or provide care. Anything that is overdoing that is a waste. Also overproduction, that one reflects well to the numerous tests, uh, exams, x-rays that we, we do that are not necessary. Uh, the perfect example is uh, uh, when I listen to a process improvement project, and one of them identifies that uh, when a patient comes to an ED for a specific procedure, I can, for, for a diagnosis, I can remember what it is, it doesn't matter for the, for the purpose of this conversation, but they used to get an X-ray, then they used to scale up to a CT, then eventually they would move to an M MRI, but they already knew they were gonna get an MRI, why are we doing the uh, X-ray and the CT as well? That is an overproduction and overprocessing kind of waste. Uh, this whole precision diagnostic medicine is really addressing the concept of stop ordering so many x-rays uh, when you go, or stop doing too much ED treatments and so on. Motion, uh, that's still very much important. Uh, it's how much do you go from one point to the other, or that it has to do with ergonomics, uh, human ergonomics, how much are you bending, moving, straining, hurting yourself, <laughs> doing things that you should have been doing. Uh, transportation, again, we see a lot of that one. Uh, when what you need from motion and transportation really takes care of these principles. What you need should be next to your work environment. If it's not, you're gonna walk and gonna have to find it and patient is waiting. I was working with uh, with the OR a while back, and they were explaining to me some, when surgeons or nurses had to leave the OR because the supplies weren't there, there is an impact to the patient. If the patient is, an, is under anesthesia for longer than it needed to be, so now the impact is, so that is a big deal. So we had to re, figure out a way to reduce motion and transportation and inventory. And then everybody's favorite is waiting. Uh, it is a kind of, imp People imply that when they come to see the doctor, they have to wait. And I beg to ask the question, says who? We are redefining that uh, at the university, at least trying to make the processes. When we say processes patient-centered, we are trying to create this, par this paradigm shift that says, how can we make it easier for the patients to come here and then go home and move on with their life? Uh, at the same time, the reason why I chose that picture because I will never forget a discussion with this orthopedic surgeon, very busy, and I was observing his processes, and here we were sitting in the OR, just me and him. He was flipping, he was twisting his finger. At a certain point, he turns around, look up, see, why am I waiting? Where's my patient? Where's my patient? And the patient had to go to the bathroom. So the patient was 10 minutes late. And we do not want to keep the highest person, highest paid person waiting in the room, which is you. And because 
you also drive, the doctor also drives the process forward. So, uh, eliminating non-value added. So, any questions yet? Why we want? Did I answer why we want to eliminate non-value added activities? Okay. So, when you go out, look all the waste. Stop thinking this is a waste of a presentation. It's not. <laughs> I'm getting somewhere with that. Uh, okay. So, when you go out. Look for all those waste. If you catch one, aha, write it down and make it known. Uh, one of the nice things about this, uh, uh, the Moran Institute, is that you actually have a very engaged uh, faculty and leadership. Uh, so that really helps. They're very, uh, there are, they're working on many projects to improve uh, patient care, but also the processes that benefit you as well. So. When I start thinking about how do you improve, uh, how do you eliminate non-value added activities and how do you streamline the non-value added by business necessary, these are two principles that come to mind, effectiveness and efficiency. Standard work, you're going to see a lot of it. Uh, we're not trying to create robots or automate everything that happens in, in, in a hospital's life, but the degree to which something is successful producing desired results should be standardized. Uh, and then once you identify ways to do something better, then we can create a better flow. And all those wastes that we talked about before, defect of a processing or production, motion and so on, those create rocks in the river of flow, in the flow river, and we want to eliminate them. So standard work is a principle but it's oftentimes seen in the form of a document, a checklist, uh, something that pops up in Epic that tells you, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, it's something that is embedded in our work life that we are accountable for. Uh, hopefully, it's the, I prefer to, to imply it is a written something that people understand that when you go in, you do a, when you are seeing a patient, this is what you do because this makes sense and is the most efficient way to do it. But really, it's a common sense. It's the one way to do something that everyone, or mostly everybody, agrees is the best way to do it. If everybody agrees that the easiest way for the patient to be brought into the room is that a patient checks in, then the MA comes and get him or her and take him to the room, and the MA takes the vial, then that's everybody does that. There is no need to reinvent it. We don't need to have the doctor going in, taking the patient back in the room because I gotta do it. Or the nurse to do it. And yes, I've seen it. Why is a nurse taking the patient back in the room? Why is the nurse doing nursing duty? So standard work helps create an environment where clear expectations reduce variation. Variation is the enemy of efficiency, so we're trying to reduce that. We're trying to understand what makes the system flow. Now, with that being said, I did not say the standard work is perfect. I'm not, I'm, never, I'm not going to imply that by the time you create this kind of document, then there is not a set standard, a set model for standard work. You create your own, or a system creates one for you, and you just adopt it, or because it's not perfect, you improve it. I hate the, I hate, I'm not, when an organization comes from the top down and say, implement this, that is not standard work. That's a mandate, but it's not a standard work. A standard work implies a common sense that you, the people doing the work, have, can, build into a pro can bring into a process and say that, yep, we have learned because we studied the process, we do it, and we, took, we collected some data, and we know that if we do these steps, we follow this checklist, but the standard work doesn't have to be a checklist. can be that. This is, this is the standard work for restocking a room. And it is a protocol that if you follow these guidelines, it takes you to an optimal outcome. But basically, if you're saying that if we do this, yep, we're going to get good outcomes. And after you do that, after you set these standards in place, now you can focus always improving them. Now you can look at the system and say, okay, now we're all doing the same thing. We're trying to reduce variation, and wow, that patient is still waiting 60 minutes. 
or I still can find my, my supplies, or I can still schedule, or I'm working 70 hours a week. Sorry, I forget, you work way more than that already. I'm working 200 hours a week. I don't even know if that's possible. But so the way you do it is by problem solving and waste elimination. And of course, visual management, 5S and 14 functions. So out of all the more important things I, I said today, and I'm not done yet, so if there is a, besides the value, non-value added, and non-value added by necessary component, this piece to me is important. Because out of all the methodology for improvement, out of all the things we talk about, there are some steps. So you're going to go out there. So the whole principle, the whole purpose about, of process improvement is this, that you have a problem, you discover it, we have a backlog, like in, the, like in the video, they had a backlog of 100 patients. And people were losing their sight because they couldn't come and see the doctor. I said, that's a pretty important problem. Not everything is so dramatic, but those, we do see those. And so you form a team. Or if it's, this is important because, remember, you may be the expert of one piece of your process, but you may not know all of, that, all of the other stakeholders, so you need other experts to come and help you to see the whole picture. So you bring other experts and you go and see. Remember, they stood and they walked and they watched the process happening, they observed it. That's what I'm talking about in there. You want to observe what is happening. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Uh, and so you want to go and walk the process. And then you want to understand it. Um, often we, we want to ask questions, we want to uh, map out, there is power in, there is some power in mapping, phys visually, physically mapping out the process with those sticky notes or on the whiteboard, writing down what you think happens and then realizing that, wow, that is not how I imagined it. Uh, especially when you bring in the other stakeholders and now you're all putting this visual in front of you and you're like, well, this is a mess, we gotta fix it. And, uh, and then you further scope it. So, and then you collect some data and you realize, oh yeah, this problem we thought was always happening, but actually happened only once, so it's not a problem. But this one here happens all the time and delays us by this much, so we want to address that one. So now you understand the process, you mapped it, you collected some data, you check with the, with the customer, making sure that this is actually a problem worth addressing. Remember, we were trying to create value for the, cost, for the patient. And then you work towards a solution by, creating, by doing a pilot. Well, no, we've not solved anything yet because perhaps what you're trying to, what you implement first, what you, your intervention, will not solve anything. But we want to test it anyway. Plan, do, study, act. It's a cycle that happens and we want to look at it. So, and we're, this is our methodology. Plan, do, study, act. Uh, we, we discover a problem. We address it to observation and data analysis. Uh, we test it and then we assess. And that's important that I mention this because oftentimes, no, well, there are two things that I see a lot happening. I got a problem, I got a solution. So let's implement that because I am the boss and just do what I say. Or even better, I got a solution, I need a problem. Come on, I want to implement this, so let's think about what can it solve. Oh yeah, that. Oh yeah, my solution is going to cost me $100 million, so I'm going to solve it. I'm going to, I'm going to implement that, so value engineers, can you give me a problem? Yes, it does happen. We can. Define the power to change. Define power to change that. For example, not having the supplies we need and spending like a lot of time trying to uh, run around finding them or you know, using uh, not the ideal instruments to take care of the patient, uh, but we've asked them to purchase the instruments and then you know, they won't purchase it because that takes money. So um, you know, we don't have the power to make them, <laughs> make them buy it. So. Thank you. I like that, and I appreciate that. If, if, yes, I have to address that. 
Don't let me leave the room before I finish, before I address that. Um, this slide is just me acknowledging that with all this observation type discussion implies that when you're going out and looking at the process, don't just look at averages, look at uh, confidence intervals. Uh, and instead of just looking at one data point, instead of addressing a problem or yeah, or doing an intervention because you see a point falling off to high or to low, look at the control charts, they will give a better picture, making sure you understand that, make sure you see that what, this is actually a normal pattern. Um, but so, we'll have more of these discussions where we'll get more into details into, this, into these methods, but control charts, confidence intervals, data analysis really feeds into visual management that is uh, our efforts to capture a more timely base uh, the work what is going on on a daily on daily what is going on and what should we what should be addressing uh, we are starting to work towards scorecards our your department has quite a few of them but the goal of this visual management is how really to help us identify what's normal versus abnormal and have, of course, a clear action plan to respond. And I'm going to throw this in there now. This quickly, this identi identifying and addressing, it's leaders, it's, that's the leader's role. So when I hear, yes, we find problems, we present them, but nobody does something about it, uh, that's a leader's problem and needs to be addressed. Remember, the cultural transformation is not over yet. We're all working towards that but it is important that we are aware of it. Um, yeah. I'm just throwing more examples of things that have helped uh, improving processes. Uh, when you can't find something, you just make it easy to find. The 5S is a really very simple, one of the very first places um, so when you finish your, your residency here, you go to another clinic or other hospital, you're probably going to start, or even here, you're going to start seeing tools all labeled up, or everything has a place. They just, this is one of the very first things that hospitals do when they try to embrace a Toyota production system. They just try to make things easy to find. Doesn't always work, but then again, we have to be able to, we have to create a culture where we can speak up and improve things as needed. And another one is forcing function. Um, when I suggested there are ways that Epic can prompt you to do something or stop you before you go to the next steps, that's the forcing function. We, we're starting to build a lot more electronically, but a lot of them in the past used to be oxygen plugs or Power cords are all examples. They basically, to do something, you can only do it one way. Or before you, could, before you go to the next step, there is a reminder or a warning. I don't, this is just my, me trying to give examples of the kind of tools and principles and methods that people are using to eliminate or reduce wastes. Uh, some of these examples have been applied within the university system uh, when I said, for, these are examples. That's what I want to talk about now. Uh, for example, envisioning the process with the patient at the center, uh, mammography uh, used to take, used for basic mammogram screens. A patient used to, get the, used to come in for their appointment for their mammo, mammogram, and they used to get the results after six or seven days in the mail for the normal patients. If you were, at, if you, had the potential for cancer, they would call you back within a couple of days, but the normal patients would get the result back within six to, six to 10 days. The doctor said this is unacceptable. Patients are concerned, they wanna know the results right away. So they implemented a process where within their means, without adding costs or resources, they were able to provide what is called scanning with results. And now you go in for a mammogram and you get your results within 15 minutes while you're standing there. That's putting patients first, because initially the clinic and the other doctors were like, I don't want to talk to the patient. That's, I, don't, I, got, I got screenings to read. 
but they reviewed the process and they made it work. And now everybody realizes this is great for us and for the patients. Make the work visible throughout the workplace. Uh, we're spending a great amount of time training, coaching nurses, but also going around and using that 5S things that I showed you before. Improving the reliability of the inventory management systems, which is a surgery department. We're working just on doing that. Uh, making it easier for them to, to replenish the supplies when they when they run out. Uh, one of the big initiatives that we we've, we've been working on has been to improve the flow of doc of the doctors within the clinic. We call it clinic flow projects. But basically the goal in there is to is really benefiting the doctors. Where they they used to go home spending ten hours on the weekend reading, reviewing, and, and answering messages through my charts. Through some tweaking in the processes, we're trying to take that 10 hours to two or something like that, improving the doctor's, the physician work-life balance. Uh, technology, I love technology. We're finally getting some of it in healthcare too. I feel like sometimes we're so behind the times. But we want to use technology in a way that it helps improve processes, not slow them down. And where do we where so when I when I said before we have a solution, give us a problem, kiosks to me seem to address a problem nobody asked. But we're gonna invest into them, we're gonna spend a bunch of money, and we're not gonna use them. Well, an improvement project eventually turned out to be that we could use them more efficiently and it helped patients experience as well as our cycle. And then it simplified the revenue cycle as well. What's next is a lot of mumbo jumbo. We talked a lot about value, non-value added, waste, standard work. Why do we need? Why do we need it? We talked about uh, uh, the problem-solving methodology, what you should be doing, and examples of how this there be, how these tools are being used within the system. And then you said yes, but we find problems and we they we bring them up to knowledge and we don't know what to do with it. Well. That is the mandate, and you are requested to work on improvement projects. So, my question is, have you guys been assigned an improvement project yet? Uh, we choose our own. You choose your own, okay. That's kind of nice, actually. And once you choose your own, do you have, uh, how are resources to help you with that project allocated? For resources, I mean people that know the data, people that can pull and know the data, or team members to help you? Not many. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's part of also why I'm here. I'm learning. So in my mind, I keep having this, how do we make the perfect learning environment for the residents, given your limited amount of time and the fact that really experiential learning is the best way to pick up something. I could go through one of my projects, but until you, it's much easier for me if we talk about your projects and then I help you go through the steps. That's how you learn best. So I think between you guys and Laura have to discuss what projects, Laura Hansen? Oh, okay. Yes, or Jeff Petey. I have to discuss what projects you're picking up for this next uh, few months, year or so, whatever it takes. And then we, we can discuss what are the next steps. My goal and my hope is, of course, that you, this project are well-defined enough, and then we can help you find those resources uh, that can help you improve something. I know I'm very hopeful. But what's next is... I just give you a taste of what's out there, of the methodology on the website. I will send you the link for it on the value por summary portal. It's found in Pulse. You can click in there under level one, service value training. There are some videos that will teach you how to, they will teach you, they will teach you um, what is value, what's waste, uh, how to do a process map, how to do a data analysis, how to do a Pareto chart, how to do all those things. Those 10-minute videos you can watch in there are quite good. 
And that just gives you additional tools and knowledge of when you do have your project, where do you get started? It seems when you do get your projects, when you start thinking, when you're thinking about what projects you want to work on, to be successful, we have learned that projects that are successful usually have four components. They take into consideration vision, team, patient, and measure. So under vision, uh, you want to really thinking, think through of uh, why do we want to pick this project now? Why, what's the patient benefit? What's in it for me? Why do we want to work on it right away? Why is, why is this important now? Oftentimes, resources are difficult to allocate because the vision is not right. My, the main reason why my, some of the, my projects have fell off, the, fell off the radar is because the priorities changed. So again, we want to make sure that what we're working on is feasible, but also has the right vision. And then the team, do you have the right people in there? Have you involved all the roles, all the stakeholders? Do, they have, do you have all the experts to do the work, both upstream and downstream? And the reasons why projects lose interest is because, or, or, because, or, or your implementation does, never gets implemented, your suggestion never gets implemented, is because you have not consulted, you meaning we, have not consulted the right, all the stakeholders. And then the patient. Uh, maybe kind of cheesy what we have in here, but it is true. What we are implementing, our solution, does it help to make it the process more convenient to, for the patient, coordinate care better, makes the process more reliable, or do help us be more empathetic to our patients? It just ties back to that initial goal of focus on the patient. And then measure. Uh, that's important too because I'm going to implement this, and I have no idea if it made an impact or not. I think that people are more willing to listen and acknowledge the need for a solution if we can provide some data and have some measures or, uh, to demonstrate our success. Uh, we're trying to be more transparent as well with our efforts to improve things, but there it is. When you are going out there and you're picking your own project and you're looking at things, those documents that I passed out is this doc. It's, it's a worksheet, and it helps you think through: Is this really what I want? What I want to be working on? And when you do that, then please go to another part of the value summary portal and enter what we call a value summary, which is eventually looks like this. Ta da! But before that, it looks like a bunch of fields you have to enter information. If you get lost, well, there is a video that shows you how to enter one, but also let me know. Uh, I can help you work with that. But the value summary is two things. It's a mental reminder, an exercise of the improvement methodology that is, oh, I got to create my team, then I have to state I have a problem, I create my team, but I gotta identify my problem, I gotta make it measurable. I gotta set a goal so I know what I'm trying to do. And then I'm going to do a baseline analysis, I'm gonna find out what is going on, collect some data, map my process and so on. Then I'm going to create my intervention, my improvement plan, I'm gonna test it out, I'm gonna monitor it, and then I'm gonna measure the impact. So that's my methodology, but also it's uh, the system-wide resource where managers, leaders are looking for at the projects. So when the question comes, is leadership engaged? This is my question. Is leadership engaged in the work we're doing? The answer is they're getting there. We're not there yet, but we do have the top leaders in organizations that do look at the value summaries. The mandate has been placed, and so more and more leaders uh, faculty and, not, and administrative are, have paid notice and they are engaged in process improvement using this language. So when somebody asks you, do you have a value summary for this? It really means two things. Are you following the methodology, but have you created one? I would say that it would really help if you have working a project, if you don't enter a value summary, retroactively enter it. So. And I say that for two things. One, you also get the recognition for it. But two, it's there for other people to see. 
the work that you have been doing. This is my introduction. Um, I, again, I tried to cover and give you exposure uh, uh, and talked about the concept of value added, non-value added, why is it important, why is it patient-centered, why do we, we, when you go out there, start looking, start thinking in terms of waste and how do we eliminate them, and we eliminate them through standard work and uh, improving the flows uh, by problem solving, various other methodologies like 5S, forcing functions and so on. And then the next steps in my mind are, if you have, any, if you have further questions, of course I'm available. Jeff and Laura are available too. Uh, but there are training videos in there. Select your project uh, and enter a value summary. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Just, just to thank you, Luca. I mean, you know, for the med students, this is essentially something that you will. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an incredible benefit to you to be versant in this. Um, just for for more or less your your own lives. I mean, you know, this is something that many of us do intuitively already. You identify a problem, see something you can improve, you do it. But this is a framework to put it into that allows you to actually measure it. And then, you know, so often we feel good about changes that we've made without ever recognizing if they actually had the impact that we wanted. And, uh, and then for, uh, again, for your residencies, uh, this, these are now required projects actually to do in residency and then when you're going into the job market. If you're someone who understands this uh, and can do it already, uh, you'll be a really good way at it. So. And then um, just for the residents, we just make sure uh, pass along to your co-residents that Either continuation of your previous QI projects or new QI projects will be presenting at the end of the year, but we do need to get value summaries on any new ones. So thank you, Luca. Thank you. See you.